welcome to 2004. And while you guys were voting for George W. Bush, a Japanese game dev was about to make history. While you guys were posting on Facebook for the first time, Kikiyama was posting Yume Nikki on 2chan. And now you might have all these questions. Yume Nikki, Kikiyama, the infamous hacker 2chan. I thought it was 4chan this whole time. And those are all very valid questions. And that's precisely why I'm here, to answer these questions. And you might honestly know more about this than I do. And you just want to listen to somebody talk about it. And I don't blame you. You know, I'm in your head. I'm in your computer too. But you're never going to find me, so... Anyway, about Yume Nikki. Yume Nikki is a game where you play as a shut-in girl named Matatsuki. It was made in RPG Maker. And RPG Maker is the simple little game engine usually made for making 2D RPGs. Yume Nikki uses RPG Maker 2003, and what's cool about RPG Maker is you don't have to be a talented programmer in order to use it. And I think this has a bunch of merit, because if you're a talented writer, if you're a talented composer, artist, you can leverage these strengths in order to compel your audience rather than using gameplay. In Yume Nikki, you walk around weird environments with weird characters. So, basically it's real life. Except, in real life, I can't spin my head all the way around my body. I mean, it's not like I've tried it before, so like, you know, maybe? Could you imagine if I just fucking died? When you start the game, you get this little tutorial. And this is basically all of the text in the entire game. You wake up in Matatsuki's room, and you can interact with a few things. She's got this game console with one game. It's the worst game ever made. Okay, it's not that bad. Actually, no, fuck this game. This game fucking sucks. I'm out of here. Fuck this shit. With nothing left to do, you go over to the bed, hop in, you know. After three seconds, Matatsuki goes to sleep. Must be fucking nice, huh? Must be nice to fall asleep after three seconds. It takes a motherfucker like me like three hours. Ungrateful bitch. I swear to God, I just catch. Matsuki, you catch me in the dream world? Catch me in the shield folk world? Man, it's, it's fucking lights out for you. I don't know. Anyway, you wake up on the balcony and you hear all this ambient music. It's like, whoa. And the reason this music is playing is because you're actually in the dream version of Matatsuki's room. So now, you go to the door, open it up, walk through, and then you're in the Nexus. And what the Nexus is, it's this collection of doors. There's like 13 or something. So there's all these doors, and this is your hub world. You open a door, boom, you're in the numbers world. Open a door, boom, I'm in the fucking Lego world. Open the door, boom. It's me, bitch. <clears throat> Matatsuki, sit the fuck down. I don't know why I'm so aggressive towards Matatsuki. But anyway, it's pretty much just like real life. So you have all these different worlds, and you can explore them in any order you want. The end goal of the game is to collect these 24 effects, and then you put them down in the Nexus, which is the hub world. So you can go into the forest world, and that might lead to the beyond world, which is also connected to the bed and bath world, and it's super easy to get lost, because all these worlds, they interconnect, and they just loop you back, some of them are one way, some of them, it's just a random chance to get there, it's super easy to get lost, but that's honestly most of the fun in the game. The game basically says, Fuck you. Comb through my levels inch by inch just to find that one NPC that you want to talk to. And then you interact with that NPC. And then you got nausea. Congratulations. But, courtesy of Booger Cheats, I'm going to show you a trick to travel around the world better. Because there's a bike you can get, which is in the graffiti world. You go to the graffiti world, and then you just hold right or left. It doesn't matter. Just hold one of those directions, and then you'll walk into the bike. But we can go faster. We can go even further beyond. So take the bike. You go to the dream version of Matosuki's room. Okay? 
you can sit in the chair and then open the effects menu, equip the bike, turn around on the chair, hop off the chair. Simple as that. Now you're moving super speed. Equipping any effect disables the super speed glitch, which, you know, I would encourage you to still equip other effects and not just try and speed run the game because that's really not what the game is all about. Oftentimes the bicycle is enough to make you feel like you're not moving too slow, but this trick will help you save a lot of time. Because sometimes you have to come through this empty ass area in the middle of bumblefuck nowhere just looking for this one random door. So if all of these interactions are part of what makes the game special, what else makes the game special? Well, it's definitely got to be the music. The music is just so out there, it's so weird. I swear dude, like half the tracks in this soundtrack are just an anxiety simulator and believe me bro, I'm pretty sure I got that department under control but you can go to the snow world and it's this beautiful scenic landscape and then you got this calm peaceful music over it and it's like ooh, that hits ooh, that's calming and then you go to the black world and it's like oh why am i in the black world i hate the black world like the music is just so stressful for an environment that has no it has no enemies there's no threats, there's no danger in this environment at all, and it's just the most repetitive, like, annoying track ever. But it's like, it's kinda awesome. Like, Kikiyama just said, man, fuck you. Anxiety music. Get fucked, idiot. Like, <laughs> like, it's kinda just awesome. Most of the music fits its environments, like, perfectly. You have the eyeball world, which is creepy, and the music reflects that, and then you have this sweet, soft piano tune and what is it it's the save theme because Matosuke the shut-in feels the safest at her desk in her room where she can save like the music is just it's like you have all these weirdo songs and they're all super thoughtful and it just fits perfectly for this weirdo game to be honest i don't intend to explain this game in depth to you there's already so many videos that have done that already and this game is insanely well documented. You can go on the wiki and find detailed maps of all the environments, all the events, where all the effects are, names of all the NPCs, even- I didn't even know they had names! It is absolutely absurd the level of dedication and love this community has for this game. You can find anything on the wiki except for information about the game's creator, Kikiyama. Because after all this time, we still know fuck all about Kikiyama. We don't know their gender, how old they are. We don't know if they're alive. People <laughs> that they died in 2011. Pretty sure that's not true. But Kikiyama will probably always be a mystery. Yume Nikki will probably always be a mystery. Try as you might to understand it. You might never get to understand Yume Nikki. It's possible that it doesn't even have any meaning. But even if it doesn't have any meaning, it doesn't make it meaningless. Because Yume Nikki means a lot to a ton of people, myself included. Yume Nikki inspires people across all sorts of mediums. And I hate to say it, Kojimi, but I think Yume Nikki might be one of the first strand type games. I call him Kojimi because we're tight like that. There's a couple of games that have inspired Yume Nikki, such as Earthbound, Mother, LSD Dream Emulator. But what's really shocking is that Yume Nikki basically created a subgenre of indie game. All these surreal horror exploration games usually made an RPG maker, which, you know, kind of sounds a lot like, you know, a Mori, yeah, Undertale, just to name a couple. I think the OG Lisa was a Yume Nikki fan game. And I'm not even gonna go into fan games, partly because I haven't played like any of them. But it's just crazy the whole sort of like freeware ecosystem that has been like. Un the Pope owns Undertale! The Pope owns Undertale! That's a Yume Nikki fan game! Kind of, sort of. I mean, the mechanics are different, but I mean, if you look at Uboa which is from Yume Nikki, and then you look at WD Gaster, it's like, come on. It's like, hey, yo, bro, can I copy, the, can I see your homework? Yeah, just make it look a little different so the teacher doesn't think we cheated type of beat. 
Like, come on, bro. <laughs> and then Amori sort of is a little bit more paying homage to it. It's a little bit more obvious of a Yume Nikki inspired game than Undertale is. Like, you got this scene where the main character is going down the stairs, and then you see all these hands come up. And it's like, mm, you got the staircase of hands in Yume Nikki. It's like, okay, you know, I see what you're doing here. I see. I'm picking up what you're putting down. <laughs> oh my god, I look deranged. Oh my god. <laughs> Play Yumi Nikki. Even some of the developers on One Shot, they originally worked on a Yume Nikki fighting game called Dream vs. Dream, but the influences go even further than the indie gaming sphere. I'm greatly inspired by Kikiyama's one man band approach to development. Like, I'm pretty sure they're a solo developer, so that means they had to do the music, the art, and they had to create these confusing yet cohesive themes and settings for the game. Like, that is not an easy feat. Kikiyama leverages all of the stuff that they know how to do in order to create a project that is bursting with raw feelings and emotions. It raises questions and it answers none of them. It leaves it solely up to you to decide what to make of it. I wonder what you'll make of it. So tell me, what does Yume Nikki mean to you? I have an extreme emotional connection to this game, in that, as ridiculous as it may sound, I related to the feeling this game evokes a lot. When I had originally discovered the game, I was in what can only be described as a suicidal depression, and my only real outlet was through playing games which is always, and will always, likely be my passion. I rarely ever left my room, and I couldn't have cared whether I woke up the next day or not. I then heard about a game called Yume Nikki from a kinda funny place, a video called Top 45 Scariest Easter Eggs in Games, where Uboa was featured, and the game looked very, very enthralling. So I played it, and it was absolutely invaluable in helping me come to terms with how I was feeling and pretty much saved my life. I connected a lot with the idea of dreams being a place where anything could be true. A place where you could wander but never have to worry about being lost. I spent a lot of my time just wandering throughout Yume Nikki, and I still do to this day. Even though I've seen everything the game has to offer, something about the game just calms me. It's an illusion. It gives me a feeling few other games have given me. My fiance had passed away before we could get married. I love her more than I can describe. I relate to a lot of funny now. Also, I know it's like I wasted so much time always hitting the blind slash gender dysphoria. She was a very artsy person, and she would have loved to see her head and body. It may not sound like much, but it's a lot of things I've never had to do. So this is really a challenge. So I'm just kind of empathizing with the challenge that comes from the challenge. It's something I really like. It's just a way in the sense. The game means a lot of my life than I did. If you read all of this, thank you. Please pick up, please pick up, please pick up. This video sucks so bad. Hey, um, can you do me a favor? Can you, like, answer some quick questions? I promise it won't take long. Come on, please don't embarrass me in front of my friends. <laughs> okay, folks, I got a very special guest for you. Give a warm welcome for Plaster Brain. She's a composer, singer, shit poster and more you might have heard her music before on youtube and wait turns out we have another composer wait maybe the budget is back do we have the budget back you mean we have flair the creator of yume nikki between the lines and on top of that we have kex kex draws from twitter the dutch artist from the netherlands what is that is that your fursona? That's pretty fucking cringe, isn't it? You're cringe! <laughs> well, would you look at that? Looks like we got a couple guests. And uh, they're not all voiced by me. I'll give proper shoutouts to everybody towards the end of the video. This section has gone on for so long. I just want to get to the interviews. How did you find out about Yuminiki in the first place? How I found out about Yuminiki was because 
My earliest group of internet friends, they were into it, and they got me to play. That was probably back in like 2011. I don't remember when or how exactly I first found out about Yume Nikki, though it would have been sometime in the early 2010s. I was about 13 or 14 and I had just begun my descent into indie media after having started by falling down the Homestuck rabbit hole, right at the peak of its popularity, and competitively playing Jazz Jack Rabbit 2. This binge spanned minimalist music, art house film, oddball anime, and most pertinently, indie horror video games, of which Yume Nikki inevitably hit my radar at some point. But I never actually played Yume Nikki for myself during that time, despite having read quite a bit about it on wikis and forums. It stood out to me for ages as a name that seemed to keep coming up in my artistic travels and definitely gained some kind of status in my subconscious for it. In January 2018, Yume Nikki Dream Diary was announced, and Yume Nikki was simultaneously published on Steam. This was when I finally decided it was my time to sit down and play Yume Nikki and form my own opinion on it. It wouldn't be fair to try and summarize my experience playing it in under a paragraph, but at the very least, I did finally understand how this unassuming little game had cemented itself as one of the foremost influences on developers within the industry. It started with me trying to find inspiration for a new OC. After searching for around an hour, I stumbled upon Matatsuki. I really liked her design, at least I liked how other people were drawing her, and I wondered where she was from. Then I found out she's from Yume Nikki which is a free RPG Maker game on Steam. Since it was free, I decided to give it a go. And look at me now. What started with looking for a reference image turned into playing a walking sim to an extent I never thought I ever would with a game like this. Do you remember how you felt about it when you first played it? Before I played the game, I knew it was a walking sim, just mindlessly walking around in areas hoping to find something new. But the feeling of discovering new worlds and new ambiences feels as though you're walking around a lucid dream in your own perspective, especially in Yume Nikki. These worlds all have their unique sense of surrealism, and the ties between them makes you question how all of it is connected, other than it all being a dream. I don't really remember anything other than getting lost a lot. I was streaming for the aforementioned friend group on Skype, but there was about a one minute latency, so I remember one of them literally called me on my cell phone to tell me I was going the wrong way. They had all already played it, and so they were interested in seeing my reaction to certain things. Maybe that and my fondness for obscure media compelled me to play any Yume Nikki fan games I could dig up and try and document them for others. And have your feelings changed since then? Mm, not really. Although I'm pretty sure there's way more to the game than meets the eye. Hell, there are people that have played Yume Nikki 10 years ago and are still discovering something new about it. Playing the game again though, the surrealism is still there, but it didn't have the same impact as it did on the first playthrough. But no matter how many times you play it, it's a work of art in and of itself. Back in the day, I used to wander around aimlessly as the genre intended. But now I'm old and everything is so well documented these days that I play the Yume Nikki online stuff like Yume Tuki as though I'm on a guided tour, i.e. with the wiki and various maps open. But the experience is still a unique combination of personal and social. Everyone in the community plays the same thing, but since there's no concrete plot and there's so much obscure stuff hidden, gameplay feels like a collaborative effort. What about your art? Has Yume Nikki had an effect on it? Oh, yes it has. It's among the first few games I made fan art for, and man, never have I ever finished so many pieces of art before. Yume Nikki is a game full of mystery and theories that have yet to be fully understood, even 18 years after its release. That's why I'm able to think of so many ideas for fan art. Anything anyone makes could straight up become a new theory, making it more interesting to think about. I mentioned earlier that I was looking for references for new OCs, purely because I had no clue what to make art for. I could have made other fan art, sure, but Yume Nikki is a pretty infamous indie title compared to Undertale and Omori. What would you say is your favorite RPG Maker game? If RPG Maker adjacent games are allowed, Irisu Syndrome by a mile. Otherwise, I've always liked The Witch's House a lot, and the longing ribbon made an impression on me. 
I'm sure I'm forgetting some since I played so many of them in high school and early college. In terms of Yume Nikki fan games, that flow always had a place in my heart. You draw a lot of characters from Yume Nikki. Do you have a favorite character? If so, who is it and why? This is a pretty hard one to decide. My favorite character is either Monoko or Ponyko. Ponyko, unlike any other character in the game, can have a huge impact on someone's experience. I'm of course talking about the Uboa event. Despite this, she's as far as I'm aware, the only character that is just like Matatsuki, having the same sprite format and having a colorful design to her. She might even have a nice personality, other than the Uboa event. Monoko, compared to Monoe, is much easier to encounter. You can find her by walking into one of those blockhouses in the white desert. Her reaction to the stoplight effect is much more extreme than others. She grows entire limbs. And not only that, she gets funky when Matotsuki interacts with her. Monoe wants to be left alone, judging by her event, while Monoko is just there to dance with whoever visits her. Another mysterious character that shares the favorite character spot for me. How would you describe your album? The short answer would be something like a collection of Yume Nikki arrangements and interpretations, but I think the long answer is far more interesting. Yume Nikki Between the Lines was a product of the fortuitous timing of the release of Yume Nikki Dream Diary and my freshly coming out of some mid-level music theory courses in college. Yume Nikki provided some of the most captivating, just unusual enough music I'd heard out of a video game in a very long time, and I was aching to exercise my newfound theoretical knowledge in as engaging a manner as possible. Yume Nikki's title theme was exactly that catalyst. It's three seconds long with two bars of three-fourths waltz, but it violated a single basic expectation of classical theory that provides it its unsettling nature. It starts each bar on dissonance before quickly returning to consonance. What a concept. Soon after I finished Yume Nikki, I quickly set about expanding on this basic idea with an arrangement of my own. Start every phase on instability before quickly setting into tonality. This was musical cocaine to me. Immediately upon completing and uploading REM, I realized this didn't have to be it. I could comb through all of Yume Nikki and identify what imbues its music with the flavor it needs, extract those seeds, and grow them into full standalone pieces that provide the ideas with all the room they need. The PDF booklet in the album's Bandcamp download provides some background on every track if you wanted to follow my process there. Another aspect of the album was that it functioned as my creative sandbox during the three years I worked on it. In every track I was trying something new, something different to what I'd done in the past. I learned to play guitar specifically for Alabaster Dreams. I iterated through five different arrangements of Another Night. I made my first hardcore drum and bass track with Pursuit. With every new piece, I was pushing the boundaries of what I was capable of and expanding my horizons. Folk, orchestral, jazz, progressive rock, EDM, nothing was off limits. To me, Yume Nikki Between the Lines was a three-year journey using Yume Nikki as a creative springboard. I explored every nook and cranny of the game and my own abilities, and I came out the other end with over an hour of music that sounded like nothing else and a full new bag of tricks and skills. I've learned an immense amount doing this album, and I'm applying everything I learned from it to my next album full of original material. What does Yume Nikki mean to you personally? Yume Nikki changed the way I look at games. Ever since I finished the game, I started paying more attention to the connections of storylines. Not only that, it somewhat changed the way I question things in real life. These thoughts brought me further into areas I was most confused about. It made me realize that it's not wrong to ask questions about anything whatsoever. It's a matter of you wanting to understand and theorize about what you want to know. And if you can't get an answer on something, theorize further in the industry. Some artists and works stand out as especially influential on other artists. Sergio Leone deeply impacted Quentin Tarantino, J.S. Bach on Bill Evans. If Akira Kurosawa is a director's director, Yume Nikki is a game developer's game. It needs not the polish and technique of practiced veterans, only to burst at the seams with unrestrained creativity and a need to communicate to its audience. I don't have a lot of opinions on Yume Nikki itself. 
but the freeware horror slash surrealist indie game ecosystem that sprung up around it has been an important part of my life for over a decade. It, along with Corpse Party some years earlier, was really instrumental in showing people the non-traditional stories you could tell with a simple tool, RPG Maker, and it offered a deceptively simple template from which to tell those stories, effectively lowering the barrier to entry. I also enjoy being part of a relatively small, quiet, but enduring fandom. It's very cozy. I'm so- I'm so sorry, Plaster Brain. I'm so sorry. I think that's all I have for you. Thank you very much for watching. Um, this is not the normal type of video I would make. Normally I make kind of funny videos, but I wanted to make something that was Yume Nikki because Yume Nikki inspires me. So this video would not be shit without all the people that helped work on it. Uh, my sister, my friends, Plaster Brain, Flair, Kex, uh, when you heard all the voices going on at the same time, that was from a Reddit thread. That was super cool of them to share their deeply personal experiences with you, Nikki. And you can too in the comments if you want to leave a comment talking about your experience with you, Nikki. I think that would be cool to, you know, keep it going. Keep the train going. Also, in the description, you're going to find a whole bunch of links. You got Flair's SoundCloud. Um, you can stream his album, Yume Nikki Between the Lines on all of your sh favorite streaming platforms for the most part, probably. I know it's on YouTube Music. I know it's on Spotify. Um, it's on SoundCloud as well. Um, you can find his Bandcamp. What's cool about his Bandcamp is you can pay whatever you want for the album and you get a PDF that goes into depth about his creation of every song on that album. So definitely check that out. Definitely keep an eye out for his original project whenever that drops. Um, Plaster Brain, you got Twitter, you got SoundCloud. Um, she's probably going to be working on the next soundtrack for Epithet Erased Season 2 whenever that comes out, so keep your eyes open for that one. Twitter.com slash KexDraws. Check out Kex's art. He makes these really cute fan arts of Yume Nikki characters, sometimes some fan game characters, sometimes a little bit of Toho in there. Uh, like the art style. Super nice person. Definitely keep an eye out for them. Um, and then you got me. I make funny videos. Um, but sometimes I also make serious videos like this. Um, but I do plan on checking out more Yume Nikki fan games. Whether I make a video on it. Who the fuck knows. Um, so if you go on my channel. You got this playlist right up front at top at the, at the top. Uh, all my favorite videos. I urge you, if you want to check out my content, check out one of those videos. And then from that point on, you can decide if you want to subscribe. Or if you're feeling ballsy, if you trust me, you can subscribe right now. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, one day, maybe, we'll go full time with this shit. Uh, but for now, that's looking like a pipe dream. But... Uh, Thank you very much for the support on the Valve Wrap, even though a lot of the comments are a bunch of dickheads that don't understand the joke of the video. Um, I appreciate it nonetheless. Um, I have a second channel that is just bullshit. It's really just bullshit. It's just filler bullshit. <laughs> but if you like me that much, you can check out that channel as well. Um, yeah, shit. That's all I got. Uh, once again, thank you very much. Does this show up? Yeah. Yeah, it do. <laughs> Probably doesn't look that good. Ooh, there we go. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> thank you for watching. Uh, I'll see you later.